the book of Philippians. We're in Philippians chapter number one. <clears throat> As we saw last week, that the Paul is sending his letter to the book of the city, the colony of Philippi, which was a mining colony in the Roman Empire. And he's giving them his thanksgiving that this is years after his ministry has been established there and he's writing back to them while he is in prison, praising God for how they've grown and what they've done, centered in a life in the gospel. This morning we're going to see, as the title says, that nothing can stop the gospel. You see, unfortunately, too much we listen to statistics. And if we look at statistics, then we can see that, well, church attendance is declining and more and more generations of, of people are say, claiming to leave the Christian faith and we can get into a mode of despair as if what's going to happen to our nation, to our family, to Christendom itself? Will the gospel be stopped? Well, thankfully, Jesus doesn't listen to statistics. Just like a mighty torrent of water cannot be stopped but flows continually, sometimes in a society, the gospel is a waterfall. The gospel is a torrent. Sometimes in a society, the gospel is a trickle. It is a small stream. But over years, over generations, even small streams can cut through rocks. The gospel is unstoppable. If we see in... Philippians chapter number 1, let's read our text this morning. We're actually going to look at verse 15. Philippians 1, 15. Some preach, indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the fence of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through my, your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For... If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convic convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only... Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. This morning, we're going to see a few things. We're going to see, spoiler alert here, that personalities can't stop the gospel. We're also going to see that possibilities can't stop the gospel. And we are also going to see that persecution cannot stop the gospel. It is unstoppable. But before we go any further... We have to ask the question, what is the gospel? In fact, all of Philippians is about living that life in the gospel, so we should have a pretty good explanation of what it is. There's a lot of confusion regarding the gospel. So let me go through a few things of what is not the gospel, which you may have been led to believe. Knowledge about God is not the gospel. Now, it is good to have knowledge about God. It is good to study theology. It is good to study the scriptures and to know a lot of things about who God is and how he works, his character and his attributes, but that alone is not the gospel. 
You can have a theology PhD and still go to hell because you're not trusting in the one it's all about, Jesus Christ. We can fill our minds with so many, as much information, but information alone, knowing the right answer, is not the gospel. Emotions about God is not the gospel. You say, well, I really feel connected to him, or I feel connected to, uh, uh, the uplifted when I come to church. Great, fantastic, but that alone is not the mark of your salvation. Whether you feel good or whether you feel bad is not the mark of the gospel. Some say, well, the gospel is about, I even saw this in an um, online forum. Someone was asking, what is the gospel? And they said, well, I'm pretty sure it starts with love God and love neighbor." Love God and love neighbor is the essence of the law. Jesus, the Pharisees, came to him and asked him, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, love God and love neighbor. Loving God and loving neighbor is not the gospel. Yes, we should do it out of thankfulness. Yes, we should follow through with loving God and loving our neighbor. But that alone is not the gospel. The gospel is not paying it forward. When I used to work at Lighthouse Ministries, uh, they used to record what they would call gospel conversations or communications that they would have with people. And there was this one time when someone came and they didn't have enough money. They wanted to get this wedding dress that was there, but they couldn't. And so the person behind them said, oh, I'll go ahead and pay for your wedding dress. Great. That's fantastic. And the clerk behind it said, oh, great. That's a gospel communication. No, it is not. That is a great good deed, a good work. It's loving your neighbor. That's fantastic. But that alone, paying it forward in good works, is not the gospel. Being a world changer and doing big things for God is not the gospel. Sometimes we think that in order for us to follow through with the gospel, we have to be those that pack out stadiums, that lead thousands of people to Christ that do all kinds of big, audacious things in the name of God, but that also is not the gospel. Finding your purpose is not the gospel. Now, it is great to to have your dream and success follow through in this life. However, looking uh, uh, constantly for where your individual, uniquely crafted purpose in this life is itself not the gospel. Finding success is not the gospel. Thinking, well, you know, I have either spiritual or financial or occupational success. What also is not the gospel is praying enough, reading the Bible enough, serving enough is also not the gospel. So what is the gospel? This is vital that we get. It is the essence of our faith, for with the gospel is the dividing line. Whatever is the gospel, definitive of the gospel, is definitively Christian. And if it does not have the gospel, it is un-Christian, no matter how moral it may seem in its trappings. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. The wonderful thing about this is the Apostle Paul clearly tells us what the gospel is. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to wonder or philosophize about it. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. This is it. He's going to tell us. He's going to remind these Christians what the gospel is. Which I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, the gospel is of first importance. Now, are other things important? Yes. Loving God and loving neighbor is very important. Being a faithful spouse is important. Being a good employer is important. Uh, Just as we finished up Ephesians and all the household duties of how we interact with each other, that's all important, but this is of first importance. Meaning, if you have all those other things but don't have this, nothing else matters. What I believe the first importance, what I also received. Paul didn't just make this up. He received it from somewhere else. He received it from the Lord Jesus Christ. It was passed down to him just as we continue to pass on the gospel today. So here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance 
with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's the gospel. You say, well, well wait a minute. What, where's the part about me believing and trusting? That's your response to the gospel. That is not in itself the gospel. The gospel is not about what you must do. It's about what Jesus has already done. He died for our sins. It's not just that Jesus died. A lot of people die. <laughs> this whole world is filled with people who die. In the hospital, I see people every week who die. Jesus died for our sins. He took on the sins of his people and paid the penalty for them in accordance with the scriptures. The only true gospel there is is that which accords with the Bible, with scriptures. And he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again, according to the scriptures. This is the profound truth that Christians throughout the ages have given their very lives for, have burned at the stake for, have been persecuted throughout the world for. It is the thing that is unstoppable. Jesus has done it. You know, this week I was driving and I was thinking, you know, why, why am I wrestling in myself with this passage. Well, there's something about it that was sort of like a, a roadblock that I was having. And I determined that the roadblock was because what I felt my soul needed this week was something that I could do. I felt that what my soul needed, what I need to rejuvenate myself was some action, some activity, some work that I could produce that would then give me some sort of happiness. Rather, what I need, what we need, what you need, is to realize that Jesus has already done it. What he offers you isn't more work on a treadmill that never ends. He offers you rest in the gospel. He died for our sins. You don't have to die for your sins. He raised on the third day. And just as he raised, one day you will raise as well. All the marks of godliness and truth that you need are here in the gospel. Be careful that anyone gives you a counterfeit gospel. A gospel that is something other than this. Because it doesn't offer you life. But on the flip side, because this is of first importance, Anyone that has this gospel is a Christian. Sometimes people wrestle with doubts and wonder about all kinds of things about the Bible and what kind of thing to believe or not to believe. This right here is the dividing line. There may be times in a sermon or you hear uh, biblical truth proclaimed and uh, your inner flesh wants to roll your eyes at it. The question is, do you roll your eyes here? In this passage, in this text of what the gospel is, this is the mark, the, the wall between being a Christian and not a Christian. I once had a uh, church member years ago, and they said, you know, whenever you and Pastor Skip preach, you, no matter what text you're in, you always preach about the gospel. Why is that? As if it was some kind of flaw. The question is, what else are we supposed to preach? These are the words of life. This is the gospel. Any sermon that does not have the gospel is an unchristian sermon. You know, sometimes I hear people and they say, well, you know, I listened to this TV preacher and he was great and, and I, I, he's so encouraging and I listen to him all the time. And then I start to talk to the people and they're atheists. They're Muslims. They're people of different religions listening to the supposed Christian preacher feeling so uplifted because the gospel is never present. What is a sermon without the gospel? Well, it's a TED Talk. That's what it is. It's at best a theological lecture. It's ruminations on whatever thing comes into the preacher's mind, but it is not itself the preaching of the word. So, this is what the gospel is. This is not hidden behind a paywall. 
This is upfront about what Christians believe. This is the core of our faith. It is not like the Scientologists where you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars before you finally find out what they believe. Here is the Christian truth. And this is where our hope stands and rests. So, this is the gospel that Paul is talking about. And he says that some indeed preach the gospel from unvenuing rivalry. Others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am he- put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Personalities can't stop the gospel. Some may preach Christ out of some kind of selfish ambition wishing to engrandize themselves, looking to enrich themselves off of other people. If the gospel is proclaimed, the true gospel that was just written, writ, uh, read from 1 Corinthians, he rejoices in that. I used to wrestle with this and say, Paul, how, how could you say that? It almost sounds like a, a blanket admission for, for false teachers. The fact is, if the dividing line is whether you accept the gospel or reject the gospel, that's the Christian dividing line, then every single person that proclaims the true gospel of Jesus Christ is our allies. You can drive down this street and see a bunch of churches. Plant City is the, the, the city of churches. There's one on every corner. And every church that preaches and proclaims the true gospel is our ally. They are not our enemy. And any church that does not proclaim the true gospel is not our ally, no matter how good at social activities they may be. So he then rejoices. There was once a man years ago who uh, was in our church, and he really wanted to be in ministry, and he had a lot of ambition, had a lot of zeal, did not have a lot of maturity. And he was frustrated constantly that we wouldn't ordain him to his ministry that he felt he had because he wasn't ready yet. So eventually he wrote the big long emails that I just love to get (laughs) about how horrible I am. He left the church and got an online ordination that you can pay for and then went out and started his own internet ministry doing things. And that's when I really understood this verse. Because what did he do? Well, he still preached the gospel. Whether in pretense, whether selfish ambition, whether to afflict me, or to say, you know what, I'm going to show you, Pastor Eric, I'm going to go preach Jesus. Well, praise God, because Jesus is what matters, not the personality behind it, not even the reason or the motivation behind it, if Christ is proclaimed. That is how unstoppable and how powerful and how important the gospel of Jesus Christ is. Now, there are those that say, what if uh, you know, someone spoke to me and... and uh, you see, I guess what I'm seeing is this. The preaching of the word is based on the power of God, not the righteousness of the preacher. It's not based on my personal life that you get blessed. It's is the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed or not. Some get confused that they, after they learn a pastor has been living in sin for years. Say, but that person said something that, that spoke to me and they... They helped me get closer to God. How could that be if they were living a life of sin in secret? Some say, well, he's he's a false teacher on other things. How can I be blessed in this way? Or how can I grow from someone who was later found out to be an adulterer? The question is, is the word being proclaimed true? If it is, it has power. That means that even if we have a problem with personalities, even if you have a problem with me, and we just don't mesh together, on Sunday morning the question is not, what does Eric think, or do I agree with him, or do I like him personally, but what has God said through the preaching of his word? Now, this of course is not a license for a preacher to live in sin and wickedness. Paul warns in Romans 2, 21, 
You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? There is a very real and serious judgment on immoral preachers. What it does mean is that none of this changes how you are to react to when God's word is proclaimed in the gospel. Because personalities can't stop the gospel. Possibilities also can't stop the gospel. We see this in verse 19 uh, through 26. What is the possibility that he has? The chief possibility, that of life or death. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. And oftentimes what we get wrapped up in is the fear of what could be and not always the fear of what is. We dream up things to be scared of. I know, I know it personally. When my son Jude last week had a, 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 a needle stuck in his foot and we had to go through the hospital and he had to have a surgery about it, my mind was filled with all the possibilities of what was going wrong, even to the extent of thinking, man, do I have to, what kind of funeral home would have a casket that size? <laughs> we can dream up things to be scared about. But the dreams and fears that we have, they themselves can't stop the gospel. He says, for I know that through your prayers you have helped me in the spirit of Jesus Christ. This will turn out for my deliverance. His deliverance here doesn't necessarily mean he knows he's going to be released from prison. That would make sense with the uncertainty later on in this passage. Deliverance here is the same word for salvation. Whether he lives or whether he dies, he knows his soul is clear. He knows he is safe. He will be delivered either in this life or in the heavenly one. He is secure. Either way, even in the uncertainty, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes forth. And for Paul, that's all that matters. His life is but a tool for the proclamation of the gospel. And this isn't just the role of the apostle. This is the role for each and every one of us that bears the name of Christian. Each and every one of us that has been transformed by the gospel, our lives need to be given for the gospel. In Philippians 1, just this passage right before it, remember what he said. I want you to know, brothers, verse 12, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. This is his imprisonment. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest and to my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He is happy that he's arrested because it emboldens others. Isn't that weird? You'd think if someone was arrested, that would shut their mouths. Rather, what it does is it emboldens them to Jesus Christ. It emboldens them to proclaim the gospel. It emboldens them to evangelize. It has been said since ancient times that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. Perhaps one of the reasons we see so much of cowardice in the American church and so much dwindling of the American church is because we haven't really suffered persecution. We act like it. We play act it sometimes. But not unto blood. There is an eager expectation that he has, as if he's stretching out his neck to see around the corner that he wants Christ to be honored above all things. This calls us to an honest account of ourselves. Is our life about the gospel? Or is it about other things? I grew up in a, uh, for kindergarten through elementary school, I went to a private school, and they had chapel every Thursday. And I remember a preacher came in and, you know, he was saying, you know, uh, he, he was a missionary in a different country and he came over and he gave the message to the students. He said, okay, I want everyone to stand up now who is willing to die for Jesus. I didn't stand up. <laughs> everyone around me did. Like, what are you doing? You're supposed to stand up. The guy here said to stand up. So everyone's supposed to stand up, right? Sometimes we go along with the motions when we need to give an honest account of who we are. The gospel requires all of us, not just part. 
For Christ gave all of himself. Paul is imprisoned and awaiting the ultimate verdict of his life or death. While being a Roman citizen, which was a status that not all Jewish people had, and the people of the provinces or land, afforded him service certain protections. He was also a Christian, meaning there was no legal precedent for how the court would treat him. He didn't know how they'd handle it. But this is the point. A man unconcerned of death is fearless and unstoppable. Paul's response, what are they going to do, kill me? If they kill me, the gospel goes forth. What are they going to do, keep me alive? Well, the gospel goes forth. For me to live in Christ, to die is gain. It doesn't matter what happens to me because the gospel itself is an unstoppable thing. And if we get that in our heads, that what, if the gospel is unstoppable, whether we live or die, then we have the essence of true bravery. Then we can march out of this place into this fallen world and nothing will be afraid to us. Nothing will fear us, or we will be afraid of nothing. There was once a sermon I heard from Al Mohler, and he was talking to these missionaries that were going into Iraq during the height of the Iraq war. And uh, they were preaching the gospel there. And he said, well, aren't you scared? And this, there's war going on. There's uh, Muslim occupation going on. Aren't you scared that you're going to die? And those missionaries' response was, we already died in our baptism. They're already dead. We are dead so that we can live to Christ. And when we give our life to him, then we truly live, for nothing can stop us. He says, for me, for to me, regardless of what the court does, he is unfearful. He doesn't trust nor hope in the decision of courts. He doesn't care what the judiciary says. He trusts rather to the Lord who is higher than all, even the Roman courts, even American courts. He says to die is gain. Not only for him to enter eternal rest and reward, but also because his death would enable the spread of the gospel. Do you live your life in such a way that even in death it means the gospel will spread? Is your life so characterized by the gospel that your living means its advancement? And your dying means its advancement too? What he's saying is this. Christ means everything to me in this life. And when I die, I get even more of Christ. For me to live... He asks, what characterizes your life? For Paul, it was Christ. Is for you to live money? Is for you to live success? What happens to all those things after you die? If it is for Christ, then for you to live and die is in him. He says, my desire is to depart. If it was up to him, he'd prefer to simply be with Christ. He is, he's put in the work. He's traveled all around, he's been beaten, he's been imprisoned, he's been tortured for Christ, he's founded churches, he's up for retirement time. He'd prefer simply to be with Jesus. This, this desire is, oddly enough, the same word in other places used for the term of lust. He really is done, okay? He wants to go on. Paul's passion is to be with the living Christ. He can face the prospect of death so boldly because of his complete confidence that when this is all over, he's with Jesus. Yet his heart is for others as they need his labor for Christ here on earth. And no matter how much you may want to move on, be retired, if you're still here, Jesus has you here for a reason because you are about to be on gospel business, for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not here by accident. You have a purpose. Death doesn't scare Paul for the Lord that he trusts has already overcome death. So personalities can't stop the gospel. Possibilities can't stop the gospel. And lastly, persecution can't stop the gospel. He says in verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. What does he mean by that? He means walk in step with the gospel. What the gospel truth is of what Jesus has done for us 
needs to seep into our bones and into our DNA. It needs to come out of our pores like sweat. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is the foundation of first importance of the Christian life. What is this, the sole core of our unity? It better be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do we gather here on Sunday morning? It better be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anything else, not only will a church that is not united in the gospel of Jesus Christ above every other thing, not only will it not stand, it doesn't deserve to. He says, Stive side by side for the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but suffer for his sake. Sometimes we hear incorrectly, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. And it involves suffering for his sake. What does suffering for his sake mean? Suffering for his sake does not mean you robbed a bank and you got caught and then you go to prison. Suffering for his sake does not mean you never show up for work and then you get fired. People say, oh, Lord, help me through this trial. That's not a trial. That's your own stupidity. That's your own laziness. Suffering for his sake means suffering for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says he's engaged in the same conflict that you, ha- that you saw I had and now hear that I still have, meaning it is ongoing, it continues, and for 2,000 years those who have trusted in the true gospel have been persecuted for it, and yet it still stands. And yet we still proclaim it. And yet on Reformation Day, we honor the heroes that came before us that proclaimed that gospel. Here's an important point. I'm about to close here. Suffering for godliness is not a sign that God has abandoned you. It says you were appointed for this. Suffering for godliness does not mean God is punishing you. It does not mean God is angry with you. On the contrary, it is a sign that God is at work in you. So we must stand firm together for the gospel. Do not be afraid. We can walk through this suffering together as we fight on to the victory already won for us in Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. If the gospel is unstoppable, then if we live our lives according to the gospel, we are unstoppable too. Let's pray. Our great God, I thank you that you have given us this unstoppable gospel. Let us embrace it as we would embrace the very thing saving us, as we would embrace a life preserver from our own death. Let us cling on to it with all of our hope, with all of our strength, with all of our might, knowing that it's not even our clinging that saves us, but your clinging to us that does. That you have us in your arms and no one is able to pluck us out of your hands. Let us go from this place with a mindset of the unstoppable gospel, remembering in this picture of the Lord's Supper, that very gospel that was proclaimed 2,000 years ago, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and three days later rose again in accordance with the scriptures. And we proclaim, Lord, this death until you return. So, Lord, let us march from this place with bravery, knowing that nothing stops you. And let us rest, Lord. Let us rest in this life and that you've already done the gospel for us. And we don't have to do the gospel anymore. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
this time, Pastor Skip is going to come and lead us in a time of reflection and invitation.